Let's do a hypothetical. I sometimes like hypotheticals. You won't like this one. Probably not. Hypothetically, the entire world has been wiped out. 99% of the human race is gone. Oh, I don't like this hypothetical. You're one of the 1% that are left, and you're leaving your hometown. You're leaving Kansas City. And you've got all of your your uh, stuff with you that you need. You know, you've got mm-hmm. water, you've got your backpack, your tent, whatever. Um, but you have room in your bag for one quote-unquote frivolous item. What are you taking with you? That's a real hard choice. Yeah. Either my copy of The Lord of the Rings or my great-grandmother's Bible. Okay. Interesting choices. I like it. Because, <laughs> I mean, it's a post-apocalyptic world. You have to keep those stories of hope somewhere. I guess that's true. What are you taking with you? And this is an object, not a person. Because obviously I'd be bringing my dogs too. <laughs> right. <laughs> nah. Um... Probably either take my complete works of Shakespeare or my violin. Both good choices. Well, I can't, you can't entertain yourself with a computer in the post apocalypse. That's true. Smartphones are obsolete. <laughs> so, might as well start playing music, <laughs> I guess. Yikes. Welcome to This Is Lit, a podcast where we drink and talk about our favorite books. I'm Elizabeth. And I'm Casey. So raise a glass and let's get started. Okay, Liz, what are you drinking today? I am drinking water. Yay! With ice cubes. Oh, with ice cubes. Yes. We fancy. Super fancy. Hydration is key. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm drinking a whiskey Coke. Yay! So, uh, today, we are going to be covering the lovely post-apocalyptic book uh, called Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mendel. Mm -hmm. Um, Because this was highly recommended by Michael Sheen, and we do what the boyfriend of Tumblr tells us to. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. He he did recommend it, and um, Karina, my fiancé, had picked it up from the library to read herself, and she kept it for me to read. Uh, And then I was like... Well, why don't we read it for the podcast? Yes, convenient. I do have to confess, I didn't finish it. I've had a very, very busy week, so I got through the first 39 chapters. Yes, and because... Oh, excuse me, 49 chapters. We both have been insanely busy. We're like, let's be nice to ourselves and forego punishments. <laughs> yes, no punishments today. No punishments today. Because... Uh, I'm already drinking hard liquor. Yeah, like a shot's not gonna do me any good. But I did read the first thirty-nine chapters, which is most of the book, and I did it all today. So like, leave me alone. Yeah, and y'all were (laughs) we tired? We tired. We tired. Mm -hmm. So the book starts out uh, at a performance of Shakespeare's King Lear in Toronto, in Toronto, Canada, Um, and an actor who the actor who's playing Lear dies on stage from a heart attack. Yes, Arthur Leander. Yeah, Arthur Leander, who is, at this point in his career, fairly famous movie star. Yes, who has branched out into stage productions because he can't. He's gotten, he's like 51, I think, in the book. And he's gotten Something a little like bit that. too old for leading role. Right. And, well, he didn't, he was tired of movies. He wanted to go back to stage. He liked yeah. the live feedback. So he had gone in and he had commented that Lear was his dream role. Uh, he'd been waiting to be old enough to play King Lear for a long time. Yes. And now that he was old enough, he was playing the role. Um, and in this particular production, they had chosen for his big scene at the end where he's going mad in Act 4, um, they had chosen to have child actresses uh, walking, running around him uh, playing his three daughters. Yes, playing the ghosts of his three daughters. Um, and he is the only one who can see them. That was a bird. No, do you see him? Oh, yep, there is a hawk on my neighbor's roof. Red-tailed hawk. Red-tailed hawk. Let's read Animorphs next. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, there's a red-tailed hawk in Animorphs, isn't there? I, I don't know. I've never read it. You've never read Animorphs? No. It sounds like a Saturday morning cartoon toy. What? Well, it's... Uh, what? You know what Animorphs is. Do I? Have, like, have I buried this long forgotten knowledge? K.A. Applegate's like novel series, like they're they're like young adult novels 
about kids who meet an alien and develop the ability to transform into animals? Nope, missed that whole thing. Okay, so we're reading Animorphs next. What the shit, <laughs> Just Liz? judging by the face Casey is giving me. Everybody's read Animorphs. I am clearly not a human being, then. You've not read... And the books have, like, a picture in the bottom corner of them in their human form, and, it, like, it's a flip book. And by the time you get to the end of the book, it's like the transformation is complete into whatever animal it is, is the main animal they turn into in that book. Nope. Absolutely bonkers. That was like a fucking scholastic book fair staple. There's like 50 books. I mean, they're all very short, but there's like 50 books in the series. I was, I've was i never read any of them. You've never even heard of them? No. Are you kidding I me? I was busy reading The Sword of Shannara. <laughs> but it's Animorphs. My apologies. You've never... You're acting like I've insulted your ancestors. I've never heard it's of this It's just bonkers. Series. You've never seen these? Like, Oh, I've seen them. I just saw the cut. Oh, yeah, I've seen them. I'm like, there's like no way you haven't at least seen these. I've They're, seen them. They were fucking those were, everywhere Those were childhood. everywhere on the book orders. Yeah, I've yeah. seen them, but th- I never read any of them. I was not big into aliens. What the fuck, Liz? Okay, so now that my <laughs> entire world has been rocked, uh, I guess we can move on. Anyways, so in this production... <laughs> Uh, there are three child actresses playing his three daughters um, that are kind of cavorting around the stage. Only he can see them, and the other actors who are talking to him cannot. Um, so those three actresses and the other two actors who are on stage with him in the Act 4 scene um, are all there whenever he collapses in From the middle attack. of the production, has a heart attack, and dies. And um, there is a, a young man in the audience, uh, Jeevan? Jeevan. Jeevan. Who uh, is training to be a doctor and a paramedic? He, a paramedic, and he jumps up on stage and performs CPR to uh, no avail. Yeah, it doesn't do any good. Arthur Leander is dead, and so he goes and comforts one of the little girls who is on stage named Kristen. Mm-hmm. Kirsten. Uh, Kirsten. Uh, yeah, Kirsten is the one little girl who has gotten left on stage. Her like wrangler is not there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he goes and, like, comforts her. Um, and they're trying to get a hold of her parents, and they can't. And they can't get a hold of her parents. Um, and so Jeevan leaves the theater. And as he does, he re- receives a phone call from a friend of his who is a, a, a doctor, doctor at, the hospital. at the nearby hospital. And his friend says, basically, in not so many words, there is a pandemic. Yes, and you need to get out of the city. You need to leave city. town. Uh, this pandemic is called, uh, in the book, the Georgia flu. It is a mutation of, of swine, swine flu. flu. And he's talking about, like, once you contract it, you're sick within hours and you're dead within the day. Yeah, it has a 48-hour incubation period. Um, once you get it, you're done. Uh, the first person to have it was a 16-year-old on a flight from Russia. Yes. Turns out every single other person on the flight on had it. On that flight, got and it from her. one person at TSA who had spoken to... All he did was talk to her. Talk to her. So this is airborne. There's no... And within a matter of days, uh, the world, about 99% of the world population yeah, is uh, dead. Jeevan is, uh, he spends the rest of the evening stocking up on supplies, and he goes to stay with his brother Frank and he calls his girlfriend and says look you need to get out of the city he was going to get out of the city but he was not going to travel without his brother and who his is brother a is paraplegic wheelchair. yeah he's yeah. in a wheelchair his brother who had been a um, war correspondent yes had been injured in the line of duty and uh used a wheelchair and Jeevan knew he wasn't going to be able to get Frank out of the city yeah uh so he showed up there with about seven shopping carts worth of Food groceries and groceries um, and they locked themselves in and barricaded down. And that's how the book starts. So yeah. it's kind of intense. And then um, uh, this book does a lot of jumping around time-wise. Yeah, yeah. It's It jumps, basically it jumps around to the weeks and years before the pandemic. And after the and, pandemic. And, well, the ones before the pandemic are kind of random in the lives of certain people. And after the pandemic, it is pretty much chronological. Yes. But it follows the specifically one person. Yes, Which is... Kirsten. Kirsten, who is uh, now a member of a group of actor and musicians known as the Traveling Symphony. This is 20 years later. 20 years later. So Chris Kirsten would be around 28. 28, 29. 
29, and she um, travels around with them uh, performing Shakespeare and symphonies uh, in the Great Lakes region. They've got, like, a two-year circuit that they do. So they kind of know this area pretty well. Yeah, at this point, like, people are doing things like hooking up horses to cars and taking the engines out to use them as, like, essentially wagons. Um, And the symphony is about 20-some people who have all been traveling together, and they perform art and theater um, in these, like, these makeshift towns, people living in Walmarts and gas stations. Yeah. Um, in small communities, and they go around to these communities and perform for them. Um, they, they say they say it's because for survival is inefficient. Yes, the uh, Star Trek quote has painted on the side of their caravan, uh, for survival is insufficient. You, you need the arts to... There's what you need to survive, and then there's actually living. What you need to live. Yeah. And uh, the quote, yeah, it's from Star Trek. It's from Deep Space Nine. Um, there's an episode where Seven of Nine, who was uh, part of the Borg Collective at one point, mm-hmm. meets these three other uh, individuals who are part of the Borg Collective with her. And they um, they all kind of interact. And, like, basically what it comes down to at the end of the episode is... They can be, they can have the nano, nanobites uh, removed from their brains um, and they will be given their individuality back, but they'll have one month to live. Um, and the doctor does not want to take out the nano, nanites because he doesn't want to kill these three um, board collective members. But Seven of Nine says they they would rather have a month to live, live lives as individuals. Yes than the rest of their lives being part of this, essentially, horde or collective. They would rather have a month to live than have the rest of their life just existing. Exactly. And that's kind of where the premise comes from. And that that theme is kind of threaded throughout the entirety of the book. Yes, it definitely is. And Kirsten has uh, one frivolous thing that she carries with her all the time. Well, two. She has two. Mm -hmm. Um, One is this beautiful paperweight that was given to her the night Arthur Leander died. And the second one are two comic books called Dr. Eleven. Mm -hmm. And she uh, keeps them because she knows that they were given to her by Arthur Leander. And so since that's kind of the one thing she can remember from before, uh, she tries to find everything she can on Arthur Leander. So like if they come across abandoned houses, she looks through celebrity gossip magazines trying to find information about him uh, because she remembers him uh, very distinctly. Um, through the book, you realize it's uh, her parents never came back for her at the theater. Her brother came and got... She was taken home with her brother, and then her brother's like, no one's coming to get us. And they fled the city. And they fled the city. And she doesn't remember year zero, is what they're calling it. Um, and... Her brother died shortly after that, so she was picked up by the Traveling Symphony. And so she's like, everybody here kind of has that story. Yeah, more or less. Um, Everybody who is alive at this point in the um, 20 years after the end of the world, essentially, all of those people have stories of people who were left behind, people who died, people who were lost. And the symphony itself has lost members over the years, uh, whether it's to a flu or to marauders. Uh, though by the time we hit year 20, things have settled down for yeah. the most part. There's less violence um, and less... Uh, There's also... People are out of ammunition, pretty much. So yeah. guns are kind of useless. We've gone back to bows and arrows and knives and things like that. But people um, also leave the Traveling Symphony because they've settled down like their friend Charlie, who they've left in this small town. What was it? Great Bend? Deborah... On the Deborah on the Deborah on the water, yeah, I think so. Saint Deborah um, on the water, yeah, Saint Deborah on the water, and they're like, okay, well, we'll be back in two years to check in on you. And okay, so Charlie married Jeremy, and they were gonna settle down because Charlie was pregnant, and they were gonna stay in Saint Deborah by the water. And so this uh, Charlie was Kirsten's best friend, yeah. And so when they were coming back two years later, she was very excited to see she, her. She was very excited to see her. And and Charlie's uh, not there. Yeah, she's not there. And Kirsten notices the town is not like it used to be. Like, they had, like, a horde of 100 people follow them into town last time that they came through. And this time they've got 
this little girl who's just kind of watching them. Uh, there, are, yeah, some of the shops that were in the town, like the IHOP, used to have three families in it. And yeah, now it's boarded up. Yeah, and... it's boarded up and gone. And then, you know, people are just acting very strangely. And so she goes and she talks to uh, the midwife, who she knew would have had to help Charlie deliver her baby. And she's like, uh, yeah, they left. Basically, she <laughs> says that Charlie rejected the advances of someone called the Prophet. Yes, and so they had to leave and town. And they had to leave town. And then August, who is her best friend, other best friend in the symphony, comes and gets her and is like, hey, you need to look at this. And by the roadside, there are headstones for Charlie, Jeremy, and their baby girl, Annabelle. But there's no... But there's no bodies. Bodies in the <sighs> graves. So and they, they're like, this is weird. So they find <laughs> out, they meet the prophet at the, their night's performance of A Midsummer Night's Dream. They meet the prophet. Yes. And he tells them that if people leave without permission, they are given tombstones. He also tells the conductor of the symphony that if they want an easy time coming back through to leave one of the girls. The 15 year old. The 15 year old with him to be his wife. And one of his wives. And they're like, uh, hell no, let's get the hell out of here. And they leave in costume and all. They're like, we're getting the hell out. <sighs> so they This leave is town. a goddamn doomsday cult. We're they, getting the hell out of they town. They're like, this is a doomsday cult, and they leave town in the middle of the night. Um, and this is where it starts to do a lot of the jumping around. Yes, and then we jump back to Arthur Leander and Miranda. Miranda, his first wife, his Miranda. His first wife, Miranda, who was in an abusive relationship with an artist, and she is the author and the illustrator of the Dr. Eleven comics. Yes. She invented the concept of Station Eleven and Dr. Eleven, who lives there yes. in the undersea, and she has made these very artistic kind of graphic novels, really, more than anything, uh, and that is her passion project, um, and she works on it for many, many years, um, but the book kind of co goes across that talks about the, her relationship with the artist and then how she and... How she and Arthur got together. Arthur got together and then inevitably how Arthur fell in love with a co-star on a movie and left her, and left her for the yeah. co-star. And um, a lot of it is kind of from Miranda's point of view, but there is one scene where Miranda realizes her marriage is over and that um, Arthur is cheating on her and it's at their third anniversary dinner party. Mm -hmm. And she's so upset that she stays up all night and then goes out to bum a cigarette off a paparazzi who's camped out in front of their house, and it's Jeevan. <laughs> yes. There's this fascinating way that all these characters are tied together. Um, so she goes and bums a cigarette off, off of Jeevan in the middle of the night. Uh, he takes her picture when she's caught off guard, um, and she runs back into the house. Uh, I really liked the scenes here. Yeah. Uh, they were very... I really like how this whole book was written. It's very evocative, I guess. Yeah. Um, the scenes that are pictured. But there's a scene here where she goes back into the house. It's got to be, you know, four or five in the morning. And uh, Elizabeth, the woman with whom her husband is cheating on her, who has been passed out drunk on the couch all night, uh, comes into her studio and apologizes, still very drunk. Yes. Uh, sits down on the floor in the studio and is looking at all of her paintings on the walls and stuff. And Miranda comes and sits next to her. And they just sit there in silence watching the sun rise and all the paintings on the wall just kind of yeah. being dappled in light and not really saying anything. It's just a very, like, there's, like, a huge amount of emotion behind the description of there that is. scene. And, and it's very... I feel like one of, one of the writing styles about this book is it's very kind of... It... It's you're able to get down deep and personal with the people who the scenes are from the point of view of, but you're also able to get kind of like that eagle eyed view mm -hmm. of what is going on, and so it feels close yet so distant mm -hmm. that it's almost melancholic. The, yeah, the, kind of the tone, the whole tone of the book, even when even before year zero, and it's just, I think it's beautifully melancholic this whole writing style yeah i really really like it and the, like that particular scene just like the idea of just like this and woman, the fake moon over the pool yeah fake crescent moon over the pool and these two women 
sitting together on the floor of this studio. Both knowing what is coming. Yeah, it's just, there's something about that that's very yeah, weirdly moving. Um, but uh, then we hop back into post-apocalypse. Yes. And people start disappearing from the symphonies. Uh, no, when they get out of St. Deborah by the Water, right? they discover they have a stowaway. And it's a little girl who's An 12. An 11-year-old, yeah. Yeah, she's 12 years old named Eleanor. And she stowed away with the Traveling Symphony to get away from St. Deborah by the Water because she was slated to be the prophet's next wife. Yes, she was promised to be the prophet's next wife. And she is 12 years old and she does not want to be a child bride. And so she has buried herself underneath the costumes and stowed away with the troop. Yes. They agree to keep her on because they don't like the prophet yeah. anymore than she does. And she tells them about the airport. The Museum of Civilization. The Museum of Civilization, which is in an old airport in... Uh, it's in a made-up town. It was... Um, Severn City. Severn City. Yes, yeah, so Severn City Airport is the Museum of Civilization, supposedly where there's a bunch of yes. things kept of civilization before the pandemic. And she A says, lot of people think it's a myth. She says that that is where the prophet came from. And that's probably where Charlie and Jeremy were going. And that is where Charlie and Jeremy said that they were going. Um, the conductor, looking at the path they normally take, um, knows that the prophet would be able to find them. And so they decide to try and go to the Museum of Civilization in Severn City um, to try and find Charlie and... Uh, Jeremy, because their thing, their uh, separation protocol is that if you get separated, keep to the route, we will find you. So if you get separated from uh, the symphony, keep following the path that we have discussed, and we will find you. Mm -hmm. So um, they're just going to go try and find them and also try to avoid uh, the prophets and his men people. in case that they are being followed. Right. And then people start disappearing. And then people start disappearing. Uh, the first two are Dita and Sa Saeed. Saeed. Saeed, who used to, I almost, who used to have a thing with Kirsten. I I almost said <laughs> I almost said say Z. Say Z. Yeah. <sighs> Can't imagine why. Um. Anyway. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Uh, these two boys who are on, they're the scouts during the night yes. watch. And they just disappear without just a trace, no There's sound, no, no nothing. struggle, no blood, no broken branches. They're just gone. And that if that weren't unsettling enough, the next day, while they're at the river. The second clarinet disappears. Yes, she's at the river with one other person mm -hmm. and is upstream of that person. There's no splash. She doesn't swim, go past. She's just gone. She's just gone. In thin air. And they go through her stuff, and they see something that they think might be a suicide note, and they're like, well, we don't know. The date on it doesn't match up. Yeah. Um, because no one really does dates anymore. So they're very confused, um, very unsettled. And, and uh, we also jump back to Javon. Yes, it jumps back to Javon. Uh, um, at the beginning of year zero, the start of year zero. After they've barricaded themselves into after they've barricaded, apartment. It's, and it's about a month after they've barricaded themselves in, and he's talking to his brother about what to do when their supplies run out, and his brother is like, I've been thinking about it, and uh, you go on tomorrow. And he's like, well, what about you? And he's like, don't worry about it. And basically his brother, Frank commit suicide so Jivan can travel freely and move there's, about and save himself. There's quite a bit before this yeah. of uh, the first month that uh, Frank and Jivan spend in the apartment. Yeah. It talks about people trying to unlock the, the door to the apartment. It talks about um, how the news reporters... He put reporters, plastic over the air vents. The news reporters report on it for a while and then gradually they go one off by station one, to be with the their stations families. go black. The radio stops working. The internet goes out. The electricity goes out. They think that, you know, it's only a matter of time before the National Guard shows up because they don't really, they, they can't physically comprehend how widespread this is. Yeah, they have no idea. It's 
they they don't realize that it's everywhere. Yeah. And then as the month goes by, they begin to realize it's everywhere. Yeah. It's interesting. I actually started listening to a new podcast yesterday. Um, it's called uh, The Edge of Sleep. Mm-hmm. And it's a different sort of pandemic. But basically in that one, uh, about four in the morning on the 5th of July, anybody who was asleep dies. So the only people who are left, this is set in like California, the only people who are left are like these two night guards from a security firm. And insomniacs. uh, Yeah, one of them is a parasomniac. Uh, Then there's also um, a girl who was dosed with speed at a party the night before. Oh my God. And an ER nurse are the four main characters that are still alive. And it's got the same very bleak, just like people don't know what to do. Yeah. When... Like, like, I mean, humans what did they are, say thirty. Uh, humanity is thirty six hours away fr- from chaos. Yeah, because yeah. of so many things in our modern world have to be monitored um, in order for things to for the things to stay status quo, and it's very, very easy for just a short period of time of things not being monitored before civilization would just kind of crumble. Yeah, and I think people are very fascinated by that concept and that's why books like this or the podcast Mm -hmm. that's why they exist that's why zombie apocalypse movies exist because people are like fascinated by it and terrified by the concept like and everyone wants to think they're going to be the one that would survive right oh i know i wouldn't (laughs) i'm being honest with myself (laughs) i'd be dead in like a week (laughs) well right and there's there's like you know there's just it's just there's something very very scary about the concept of all of the civilization's rules and, like, amenities going out the window in a blink of an eye. Um, And that's why it's so interesting in this particular novel that what some people have chosen to do in the wake of the apocalypse is continue to be artists, you know? Yes. Um, At any rate... We need that. Um, At any rate, uh, the book spends some time with Frank and Jeevan... Uh, as they come to terms with this. Yes. And as they experience the loss of different civilization amenities one by one. First the television, then the internet, then the mm-hmm. electricity, uh, then the water. Um, and then finally Frank essentially tells Jeevan, I can't walk. You can't negotiate a wheelchair yeah. in a violent world. Um, I And he takes sleeping pills. Yeah. He overdoses um, on sleeping pills after he finishes his manuscript. He finishes his manuscript, even though the man he was writing it for is yeah. long dead for sure. But it was important to him to finish it. And he takes sleeping pills and dies, and Jeevan sets out on his own. Yeah. And he eventually settles in a small town, and then we shift narrative again. We go This back. is where I'm, that's where I'm at, basically. Okay, we go back to uh, Miranda. Yes, Miranda. Arthur's first wife, and um, she gets a call. Her last meeting with Arthur, essentially. Uh, that's not till later in the book. Yeah, oh. no, it's right here. It's she, right here? She goes to the King Lear, like, during oh, yeah, previews. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm getting it. Since this book jumps around so much, it's kind of hard to keep the scenes in order. Mm-hmm. But before that, we also have her scene where she is told that Arthur is dead. Oh, that was way back. That at the was beginning. way, way, way. That was back the at the beginning. But... And she's in what Malaysia, mm-hmm. and um, she's told about Arthur's death by his friend Cluck. Yes. And then it also covers her uh, her death. Uh, that's later. That's uh, later? Is that after? No. This, right now what happens is Miranda gets a, a message from... Yes, it is her last plane ride where she is exposed. Miranda... <laughs> um, Miranda gets a back. call from Arthur is where yeah. we're at. Miranda gets a call from Arthur and he tells her that his father has died and she arranges to go to the theater where he is going to be performing King Lear. They're in yes. previews and meet him. And so she goes and she has a cup of tea with him. He tells her about a book, which we've read some excerpts of already at this point, um, called Dear V, in which uh, Arthur had written letters to his childhood friend Victoria um, for years and years. And she'd never written back. And she sold them. And she sold them and they've been published into a book. And uh, at one point, Kirsten, in the 
Apocalypse Time had yes. owned a copy of this book uh, that she had taken with her when they had left Toronto. And she... Because it was the only book her mother wouldn't let her read. Yes, her mother wouldn't let her read it. And so whenever she and her brother left Toronto, she took it with her. She's lost it by now, but we yes. do get to read some excerpts of it. Some of his different... Uh, first him saying that he's going to be married to Miranda. Then saying yes. that he's leaving Miranda because he's fallen For in love with Elizabeth, Elizabeth. And then leaving Elizabeth to be married to his third wife, Lydia. And... Um, at, at any rate, he tells Miranda about this book's publication. He tells her about his father's death. They have a cup of tea, and she gives him uh, the printed copies of Station Eleven. Yes. That will later become Kirsten's. Yes. Um, he also, uh, she also gives him back returns a his paper paperweight that she stole from his study, which also ends up in Kirsten's possession. Mm-hmm. Um, he also has sent two cop. He, he has two copies of the uh, Station Eleven comic book series. One copy he has sent to his son, Tyler, who is his only child that he had with Elizabeth, his second wife. Okay, okay. And That's then, what I thought. And the That's what I thought. Yep. Uh, God uh, damn it. I know. Um, <laughs> that was my guess. That was my guess. You whenever they... nail on the head. Um, you know me. I'm very good at... Yeah, I knew it too. But I'm just like, huh. Um... <laughs> And the other copies he has, he gives to Kirsten. Kirsten. And, um, of course, he, he gave the paperweight to Kirsten's handler. Yes. Tanya. Tanya. Who he was having an affair with. And And he, Tanya gave it to Kirsten the night that he died. Yes, to cheer her up. So, the night he... We don't have his perspective yet. That's the very end of the No. Book. Um, so the next thing that happens, it looks like chapter 40. This is where I'm, yes. I'm off at at this point. This is a point that says uh, Miranda is in Malaysia. Yes, Miranda's in Malaysia. And she's getting ready Malaysia. to get on a flight. And, yeah, she so is... So I'll, I'll just tell you what the beginning of the chapters say, and then you can tell us about what happens. Thank I you. Okay, it. cool. Good to know. So Miranda's getting ready to get on a flight. Because uh, Miranda Malaysia. works for a shipping company, and she's she likes her job, mm-hmm. and she enjoys it. She likes being a businesswoman. She likes not being poor, but she is getting ready to get on a flight. Or is this when she's just gotten back to Malaysia? It says she. Yeah, she's just gotten off of the flight. Yeah, she's just gotten off of the flight to the Malaysia, and then that's some lovely atmospheric rain we have. Yeah, um, we put that in special. Yes, we put that in special because this is a very sad scene coming up. This next scene kind of covers Miranda and what she's thinking about with her Dr. Levin, and she um, gets the Georgia flu. And it kind of goes through her last days and her last hours, and she decides, she's like, you know what, if I'm going to die, I'm not going to do it in this hotel room. And so she picks herself up and drags herself to the beach to die looking at the horizon and the open water and the ships that are anchored out at sea. Yeah, the last line here says, uh, or the last, let me uh, read the last paragraph on that page. Uh, Miranda opened her eyes in time to see the sunrise, a wash of violent color, pink and streaks of brilliant orange. The container ships on the horizon suspended between the blaze of the sky and the water of flame. The seascape bleeding into confused visions of Station Eleven, its extravagant sunsets, and its indigo sea. The lights of the fleet fading into morning, the ocean burning into sky. And then she dies. And if that doesn't get you as like a final image, I can't help you. Yeah, it's pretty fucked up. Yeah. What so, is the next heading? The next chapter, chapter 42, um, it talks to... about the Se- Severn City Airport. Oh, so this is back from Clark's point of view. Clark is the best friend of Clark Arthur. Clark is the best friend from of, childhood. of Arthur from his uh, uni days. From his university days. Um, right. And uh, Clark has been given the task of telling all the ex-wives about Arthur's death. So we're still back at uh, year zero. And so he uh, gets on a flight to go to Arthur's funeral because Arthur wants to be buried in Toronto. And so he gets on a flight from uh, England to Toronto and he realizes Elizabeth and Tyler are on the same flight with him. And they are diverted 
from Toronto Airport to Severn City Airport, where they are landed and get off the flight. And then they start watching the news, and they start seeing all the information about the Georgia flu and the pandemic coming through. So they are uh, grounded in Severn mm-hmm. City. Mm-hmm. And so he buys a lot of tea because that's the thing he's like, I can control tea and it's fine. But they have effectively shut down all airport travel. Uh, they've shut down any kind of travel. And so you, we see the same thing happen with them where the newscasters go off air and the electricity goes off air. And, and um, you know, they talk about um, you know, eating all the snacks out of the vending machines and buying all the food. And uh, this also, this scene also goes into how the uh, museum got started. And it was started by Clark. <laughs> um, and so he talks with, I, I will say, one of the most visually spectacular things about this book that is also that also haunts my dreams is they uh in the early days of the pandemic they had a flight land in severn city on the tarmac and nobody got off they would not let anybody get off because it was quarantined and so they are stuck in this airport looking at this airplane that has landed that nobody has ever come out of and I'm like, that is a horrifying mental image. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, but it talks about um, one of the other pilots who is there. He's like, I'm going to try and go to L.A. And so some people go with that pilot to go to L.A. Um, to try and find any other kind of survivors. And then there was another pilot that went uh, somewhere else to find his family. And he took some people with them. So some of the numbers have dwindled. But they eke out a survival. They send out a hunting party once all the food has run out, and um, Clark, who's, uh, Clark is missing his boyfriend, Robert, who was a curator for a museum, and so kind of in his honor, in the Sky Lounge of the airport, does he start keeping things, like this one man's Amex card, or there was a girl who needed antidepressants Mm -hmm. and didn't have enough and so they kept her driver's license uh elizabeth and tyler put up their passports there um and then he goes back and somebody's like oh look somebody left a laptop somebody left an iphone and so this starts kind of the museum and um then there's one day he is kind of walking around and he's like he sees tyler reading Bible verses, like Sodom and Gomorrah Bible verses, to... And suggesting that the people who survived the pandemic were the good people. Were the good people. They survived because they were the good people. They were the people of the light. This is a child. And he is reading these Bible verses to the airplane full of the dead. (laughs) And he's like, I'm gonna go talk to Elizabeth about this because I'm worried about her son. And um, he goes and talks to Elizabeth, and Elizabeth is mentally completely broken. She has, like, severed ties. She's crazy. She and Tyler leave the airport in year two. And Clark doesn't know what's become of them. (laughs) And so then we go back to year 20 with uh, Kirsten and August. Who have just rolled up onto the airport. Uh... Yeah, well, they went scavenging. For, remember, well, they found also a home. In, interspersed in between here that we yeah. haven't talked about yet are the interviews. Yes, the uh, interviews. Kirsten is interviewed by uh, Francois Diallo. Yes, um, a gentleman who is trying, who is trying to start to a newspaper. A, who's trying to start a newspaper in the post-apocalypse? Who has was a librarian in his mm-hmm. last life. And he interviews her about the places they've seen because she travels and most people at this point have settled down. Yes, most people don't travel anymore. Um, And also because she knew this famous actor in his final days and he asks her a little bit about about Arthur and a little bit about her memory of his death and of the King Lear production 
and of the eight years of her life before the world. Yeah, and she said she doesn't remember much. Like, she can't even remember her parents' faces. Right, but she can remember that there was a light in the refrigerator. Yeah. Things like and that. There, and it was cold came out of vents in the house, things like that. Um, and so these newspapers do eventually make it to Severn City Airport, where Clark sees them, and he's like, well, would you look at that? Um, and he just doesn't really kind of think about it ever again. Well, no um, more newspapers came Yeah, no more newspapers came out. Um, they also, there is a scene where... Hang on. Sorry. There is a scene where Kirsten and August do get separated from the, the symphony. The rest of the gr- symphony. Yeah. That happened earlier. Yeah, that happened earlier because they went to... They often go up and scout ahead trying to find supplies and things like that so they're at a golf course and they're fishing and then it rains and they think maybe the symphony has passed them by Mm -hmm. and um they didn't see it in the rain and then they realize they should have come up upon the symphony by now and they haven't and they don't know why and so they also end up finding an unlooted house it was locked when they got there and they're like oh my gosh this is what a house was like before (laughs) <laughs> so um, they were fascinated by it because everything looked like everything was still set up like it was supposed to work but yeah yeah it's kind of like the shadows of the previous world remain yeah um, we also have a scene from the perspective of the second clarinet who uh, so we realize as the audience uh, that the prophet is following the second symphony um, and that the second clarinet was able to escape and warn them. And so they diverted their path to avoid the prophet and his men. And so, uh, but Kirsten and August don't know this, so they come across the men and end up saving uh, Sa- Syed. Syed. Say, Saeed. Saeed. You said Sayzed and now it got I'm in my head. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm constantly thinking about Sayzed and how much I hate him. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm so tired. I just want to see my family. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, uh, they come across. Uh, so they save Say, Say, Saeed. They save Saeed and Saeed not... tells them that... Yeah, he was with Dieter, and Dieter is dead because they overdosed him, pretty much. The Prophet's men were hoping to get to do a two-for-one trade for the bride that stowed away in their caravan uh, for the Prophet. So he ends up escaping. There were That's why they took the second clarinet, but she was able to escape. And so they're like, well, you know, we have to get to the Severn City Airport and get, you know, get back with our group to -hmm. tell them what's coming, what's coming. And, um, they are overtaken on the road by the Prophet and his men. She, uh, Kirsten manages to, um, hide, uh, August and, um... Said, but she is discovered and he calls her Titania Mm -hmm. uh, by uh, Prophet's two men one of which is a young boy who begged to go with them when they left St. Deborah by the water Mm -hmm. and the conductor said look we can't take you because we don't want people to think we kidnapped you Um, but he um, he calls her Titania and he's like oh He's, he's going to kill her. Um, and in justification, he quotes something from the Station Eleven comic. And Kirsten, Wait, 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 wait. Repeat that. Uh, before the prophet kills her, you know, he's doing... Before the, the prophet kills who? Kirsten. Because he finds her on the road. Okay. Uh, before he kills her, he quotes something from Station Eleven, and she recognizes it and continues the quote. But it distracts him long enough that the young boy that they refuse to take with them at the beginning ends up shooting him in the back. 
Because he's like, this man is batshit crazy. Right. And then he can't live with what he's done and turns the gun on himself. So it's not a happy ending for the prophet. Um, is that the end of the book? Because you skipped a bunch in here. Nope. That is not the end of the book. You skipped a bunch. Uh, that happens before they even get to the airport. Before well, Christmas yeah, but August. there's stuff that happened in between. Like, yeah. chapter 46, which happens right after Miranda's bit, is Jivan in year 15. Yes, Jivan in year 15. Uh, he This establishes that Jivan has kind of settled into a tiny little town and has become the town doctor there. So he also has a girl that is his wife, but he ends up treating a woman who has been shot in the side by the prophet um, because she was kidnapped and they, she and her son were kidnapped uh, by the prophet and his men and held hostage until the tiny town they were from would give up all their ammunition. And so once they did that, they returned the boy, and the prophet was like, I'm going to keep the woman and make her my wife, and she refused him, so he shot her so she would bleed to death out on the road. And her husband found her and took her to Javon to seal her up. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's pretty much that whole chapter. And then the chapter after that appears to be Clark in year 19 realizing that Tyler is the prophet. Yeah, Tyler's gone batshit crazy. Tyler being Arthur's son. Yes. He, uh, Arthur Leander's son. If you hadn't figured it out yet, Tyler is the prophet. Yeah. And chapter 47, Clark is told by uh, Charlie and Jeremy. Yes. About the prophet, and he realizes it's Tyler. And the symbol he uses, they said, looks like a lowercase t with an extra an slash airplane. through it. And it's the sign for airport. <sighs> and uh, Elizabeth is not with him anymore. No. So whatever's happened to Elizabeth. Think she sur- I don't think she would have survived very long. So then then we jump back to there to Kirsten and August yeah, on the to outskirts Kirsten and August. of Severn City. Um and then they have that whole the prof the end of the prophet. The prophet being killed. Yes. And then um they Uh, Kirsten and August get to Severn City. They meet back up with the Traveling Symphony. All our friends are fine. And they meet back up with Charlie and Jeremy and their little girl, Annabelle. And so everybody is reunited at the airport. Um, They're relieved that the prophet is gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, Clark, who's in his 70s at this Mm -hmm. point, recognizes... uh, Kirsten. As the little girl. As the little girl from the King Lear show. Right. And so he's like, uh, your friend Charlie told me that you are fascinated by electricity. And so they climb up the uh, tower to the airport. And um, out in the distance, they see a place that is a little less dark than the rest of the world. And Clark is like, I don't know how they did it. But they did. And so out in the distance, they see a town with electricity. And that's kind of where we leave uh, uh, Kirsten. And Kirsten donates her copies of Dr. Eleven to the museum and to Clark. And Clark recognizes one of the dinner scenes as the third anniversary that he attended, the third anniversary dinner that he attended with Arthur and Miranda. Mm -hmm. And so it's like everything is kind of finding its way back to its place. Everything's slowly writing itself. And then the very last chapter... Is Arthur's last day on Earth. Is Arthur's last day on Earth. And he... The death of his father has really messed with him a lot. And so he, he wants to start doing some good with his life he wants to be there for tyler he calls tyler Mm -hmm. and talks to him talks to him about uh the dr 11 comics and he's like i'm gonna take some time and then i'm gonna be there for you um and take care of you and he tries to mentor kirsten and he talks to tanya who is the wrangler for the little girls and he tells her look i'm gonna pay off your student loans (laughs) 
And then he gets, he, and it, as he's going through the day, he's feeling worse and worse and worse and worse until his death on stage. Mm-hmm. And that is, here we go. Uh, a man in the front row was rising from his seat. Arthur cradled his hand to his heart exactly as he'd held the bird. He wasn't sure where he was anymore, or perhaps he was in two places at once. He could hear the waves on the beach. The stage lights were leaving trails through the darkness the way a comet had once when he was a teenager standing on the dirt outside his friend Victoria's house, looking up at the night. Comet Hayataki suspended like a lantern in the cold sky. What he remembered from that day at the beach when he was seven was that bird's heart had stopped in the palm of his hand, a fluttering that faltered and went still. The man from the front row was running now, and Arthur was in motion, too. He fell against a pillar and began to slide, and now snow was falling all around him, shining in the lights. He thought it was the most beautiful thing he'd ever seen. And that... Uh, yeah, that's, uh... That's the book. Yeah. It's... Wild. It is. It jumps a lot. It jumps around a lot. It's very like dreamlike i guess it is um it's it's very like cerebral in nature and you feel like you're kind of reading your way through a dream and like it's cool because you can figure out the connections between people before they can it's the book is just rife with dramatic irony yeah um but none of it really means anything like it's not like yeah well like the fact that the prophet was Arthur's son, in the grand yeah. scheme of things, means nothing. No, it doesn't. The things but that... But we know it because we've been there through the whole story. It's really interesting because the things that tend to survive in this novel are not necessarily people, but the art they left behind. Like, the yeah. Station Eleven comics out survive Miranda. The museum will outlive Clark, clearly. Arthur Leander's career outlived well, him into the apocalypse. Well, uh, yeah, and uh, Javine's brother Frank, before he died when he was working on that uh, memoir. Yeah. He, he, said, he said in the memoir, I've been thinking a lot about immortality and um, this philanthropist that he was writing it for talking about how People become actors because they want to be seen and because once you're an actor, once you're on stage or in a film, like, you're immortal. Yeah. Even if you're just a bit player in the background, like, you're eventually, you're effect effectively immortal because you left behind something that says that you were here at all. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things that Tyler was the prophet or that no. Clark and Kirsten both knew Arthur. What matters in the grand scheme of things is that long after people are gone, their legacies are still there. Yeah, the the culture that we create will survive as long as humanity survives. Right. And then, of course, there is, like, the hope there. Yes. That I mean, humanity the, is going to be able to move forward again. Yeah, like, the 99, book ending with Kirsten seeing a city with electric yeah. light. 99% of the population has died, and they're still performing Shakespeare and Beethoven and... Yeah. You know, even Shakespeare lived in a plague-ridden time where he didn't... You know, a lot of people thought the world was ending then. I mean, a third of the world did... A third of Europe did die in yeah. the plagues. Like, it must have felt the same way. But, yeah, it's a... It's a very weird book. I don't think I'll probably be able to shake it for a while. Yeah, it's one of those that sits with you for a bit. Mm-hmm. For sure. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to finishing the last few chapters that I didn't get to finish. And, like, actually reading Oh, the reading language them out. is stunning The language beautiful. is absolutely beautiful. It's gorgeous. Um, but, yeah, it's uh, real interesting. It's not like a lot of other post-apocalypse books I've read. Yeah, sure. it's, it's a book where when I first finished it, I wasn't quite sure how I felt about it. <laughs> it's, um, I don't know if it's time or distance or just kind of having some time to dissect it and let it sit with me a little bit, but it's, I like it more a couple days after I finished it than when I was in the middle of it. Interesting. How many bottles would you give it? Um, I'd probably
probably give it three and a half. I'd read it again. I wouldn't read it for a happy read, but I would read it again. Yeah. Just to kind of, you know, just sit with the language a little bit, because the language is stunningly beautiful, mm-hmm. and all the imagery is very evocative. Yeah, it's it's got a very dreamlike quality to it. It reminds me it is. of... It's very uh, dreamy. It reminds me of Murakami's writing. Uh, Murakami is like a magical realist. He's mm-hmm. Japanese. He writes a lot of magical realism. Very big fan of his books. Did we do After Dark? I don't believe we have. Well, we're gonna at some point. At some point, yes. It's one of my favorite books of all time. It's very um, ephemeral and very, like, dreamlike in quality, and I really like it. I would give it four bottles. Yeah. I really, this really a, enjoyed it. This is a good book. Um, and I would definitely recommend it to anybody who likes um, post-apocalypse or oh, ruminating yes. on the meaning of life. It, Yeah, definitely ruminating <laughs> on the meaning of life. It's a very good book for a day like we have recording today where it's gloomy and rainy and all you want is to just to curl up with a existential book and a nice hot beverage. Mm-hmm. And so thank you guys for listening. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, next book out will be the fifth Harry Potter book, Order of the Phoenix. Yes, on Halloween. On Halloween. On Halloween. Spooky season Very is upon us, my and friends. Appropriate. I hope you've been spooky for the last two weeks and will continue to be spooky for the next two weeks. Big yes. spooky fan me. <laughs> uh, and the next book after that is TBD. Yes. So keep an eye on our shit, and we'll tell you then. Uh, in the meantime, you can find us Michael wherever. Sheen, if you have any more recommendations for us. Michael Sheen, listen to our podcast. Oh my god, I would die. Uh, <laughs> you can listen to us anywhere you get your podcasts. Uh, we also have a website, lit- literaturepodcast.com. Yes, and if you're feeling exceptionally generous, we do have a Patreon. Casey is getting married. I am having two children. Please help us. <laughs> or follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. Thank yes, and you. tell all of your friends, too, to listen to us. Yes. Thank you guys so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you for listening to our podcast. For more information, visit us at litliteraturepodcast.com or check out our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram pages. And remember, too much work and no vacation deserves at least a small libation. Cheers. Cheers.